Rachel. Um, so since I'm on this end, hi everybody. Thank you so much for spending time with us. It's wonderful to see you, um, especially after all this time that we've had apart. Um, I started acting when I was five and I did every play I could do. I went to college and grad school. I have a BA in acting and a master's in acting. I toured the country with many acting companies. I had an audition through um, a recommendation from an acting coach. That's what got me into voice acting, really, into anime. And then it just kind of spiraled on from there. So it's, uh, for me, it was a combination of training and being in the right place at the right time. Hey, what's going on? Everybody having a good time? Yeah. That's good, that's good. It's good to actually see people in person. This is good, right? <laughs> exactly. Because the lighting on my Zoom stuff is really terrible, I'm told. Um, so uh, the Reader's Digest condensed version of how I got into a voice acting, acting is um, I was a musician first. Um, and uh, I always wanted to um, work in a recording studio, do anything that involved music. And I also used to teach tennis. And one of the members at the tennis club owned a recording studio and knew that I was interested in that work and offered me a job. But I thought it was a music studio. It turned out that they did casting and production for radio and TV commercials. So I learned all about voiceovers um, from behind the scenes to then slowly but surely, I would have to jump into the booth during auditions and fill in for people that didn't show up so I could read with them. And um, the clients would listen to the casting tape and say, we would like to pick the, the guy at the end, but he didn't say his name, so we don't know who that is. And I would say, well, that's, that's just me. I'm, I'm just filling in, actually. They're like, yeah, but we want to book you. <laughs> so um, I had an opportunity to, to, uh, to go on the road as a musician, and I thought to myself, you know, what would be a great job would be something that I could do anywhere there was a studio. Um, I guess I'm going to do voiceovers. And so I've been doing that for close to 30 plus years, and um, that's how I sort of stumbled into the business. So there you go. That's so cool. And I, I love this, um, I love that you brought up stumbling into the business, because it's amazing what happens when you pursue something you love and you're open to possibility. Um, I started out as a sci-fi fantasy fan, and I loved movies so much, I wanted to get in them and be a part of them. And uh, I thought I would work backstage. I thought I would be a director, lighting person, something like that. And um, uh, my mom said, well, if you wanna do that, you better join the theater troupe at your school. And I was bitten by the bug and I avoided acting for as long as I could. Um, I just knew it was a hard path. You were like Meryl Streep. Is that right? Yeah, she's I'm so everything. much like Meryl Streep. Like Meryl Streep in so many ways. Um, but finally, you know, I, I just loved it so much. I, I went to a two-year program that included acting, voice, movement, uh, and it was awesome. Um, so then I was doing theater in New York, mostly for free and loving it, and um, and a, a friend, someone within my community, that's the other thing, like finding your people, finding your community, said, do you do voiceover? And I said, yes. <laughs> um, and that turned out to be an audition for Pokemon. And I got to read for all the parts, and reading for all the parts, I swear, was like my initiation. I quick had to learn on the spot how to do this. Um, yeah, and then I got into Pokemon and that opened the doors for other things. That's so awesome. I love hearing stories about my colleagues that I never knew. I love that. I mean, I was invited into the industry because I had the same initials as Eric, ES. That's how we do it. They just call me the other ES, pretty much. But. <laughs> We joke about that, but um, I, similar uh, to, to a lot of these folks here, um, started in theater. I was obsessed with um, dancing. I wanted to be a rock cat when I was little. Um, that was my first love, and musical theater, and then I, you know, 
I love Whitney Houston, obsessed with her. Loved singing everything, musical theater, and um, fell in love with Shakespeare in high school. You know, saw every play there is. I think I, maybe one I haven't seen. But, um, and then I went to NYU, got a Bachelor of Fine Arts in acting, and, but I always knew it from a young age that I would be the voice of a cartoon, and I would be on Broadway, but I didn't know when those things would happen, or how, but I was going to make them happen, because um, that was my dream. You know, we all have dreams, right? <laughs> um, and my father was someone, and my mother supported that. They never said, you can't do that get a backup job, um, oh, you should be a chemist. They understood that it's my life, I'm the one who has to live it, and if I really want it bad enough, I'll get it. So um, shortly after my uh, first and only Broadway show, um, I discovered voiceover because, and then it just took me in a whole nother direction. Um, and my first thing was, um, this is so funny, this is why when I'm talking to your daughter, sometimes I'm trying to call her Raina or Rena or Rain. I keep changing it because the first thing I did was with you, Ultra Mantica. Yes. And they changed my name after six episodes. So they, they changed I'm so the surprised that show was so well organized. <laughs> I'm sorry. But anyway, no, that was my that was my foray into it. And like so we were in that show but we didn't like meet, which is crazy. We didn't meet in person until this con. Till like a we, Friday night. We've met. I know. We've met on Zoom. We've, yeah. Yeah, but it was this, so it's really special to be here with everyone. So that's my story. Okay, well, expanding on that, and we already kind of heard a little bit of uh, Megan's story, but we'd love to hear, uh, and if you want to expand on it, that's perfectly fine. We'll go around again. The story of getting cast in Pokemon. So I'm sure each of you have kind of your story about how that happened for you. And so we'd love to hear it. Who wants to start? <laughs> All right. Um, so when I auditioned for uh, Pokemon, I was one of the, maybe, I don't know, there were like 10 of us that were doing some of the anime stuff in town. Um, it was still like, anime was the, the VHS tapes you find in the back of a blockbuster, if you even remember what that is, right? It, it, it's so amazing about what it, it's become, and it's so great to see so many people that are fans of this stuff. Um, so I was on the short list of like, yeah, let's let's see Eric for this stuff, and I auditioned for uh, Brock and James, and I got nothing. I, I didn't get anything. So I go home, and I don't know, maybe it was about a week later, I get a call and they say, hey, could you, could you come in because we don't like the guy that we booked for Brock and you're the second choice. <laughs> and I was like, thank you? <laughs> okay. So I went in and um, I was Brock. And um, for those of you who are old school um, anime fans, um, my favorite show growing up uh, was Battle of the Planets with G-Force, if you remember that show at all, okay? So one of the stars of that show was the great Casey Kasem, who was Mark from G-Force. G-Force transmute. So when I had an opportunity to work in anime, I thought I needed to do my version of Casey Kasem, um, but a little higher register, because he's a little younger than Mark from G-Force, and not as stoned as Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. <laughs> So, um, so I was Brock, and that was great. And then a, a very dear friend of mine was playing the role of James uh, from Team Rocket for like the first five or eight episodes. And he's also a, uh, a theater performer, live theater, and had an opportunity to do a show and decided he was going to leave. And they were like, oh no, we need to replace him. Well, of course, call that number two guy again, right? Because he's really good at being the second choice. So I, um, I went in to um, voice match what my friend had been doing on the show. But what's interesting about Pokemon at that time was the shows were gradually coming in. So the director, I love him, really didn't have a sense of where this show was going. No one did. Like, um, where are these characters? What's their relationship? All of this. So they had been directing Team Rocket to be legitimately bad guys. <laughs> 
And I walk in and I say, are you sure that these two are not the comedic relief of this show? <laughs> no, no, you, we need you to be very straight. They want, they want James to be this flat delivery and everything is like this. And I'm like, hey, okay. So I started that way. And then maybe two more episodes in, James was in a dress. <laughs> and that's where the, woo! Ooh, yes, which is totally stolen from Ed Wynn and stuff like that, and um, all the crazy, all the crazy stuff I brought to that that character because we discovered as, as a production team that oh right, Team Rocket is supposed to be funny. So um, yeah, and it was great. I mean, obviously playing some of the Pokemon, you know, Squirtle and things like that were fun. Um, and then I was, I'll just end with this: the the other character I played on there that was a, a, was a lot of fun to play because I wanted to make sure that Rock and James sounded very different and that you didn't recognize it was the same actor. I know some of you come up to me and say, when I was six years old, I totally knew you were the same. No, I know you're lying to me. Um, but the third character that I played that sometimes would speak to those two was Butch, the other team rocket. So the fact that those three guys can talk to each other in a show, I wanted that episode to be called Eric Stewart featuring Pokemon. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> the producers saying, Eric Stewart can't do any more roles. <laughs> <laughs> and then they cast him again. Yeah. And then they did. I remember auditioning, uh, we got to watch a clip of the show, and uh, we had to voice match. I don't even, I must have auditioned for Ash and Misty. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't remember it exactly, except that I remember loving just that tiny, tiny bit, the colors and the energy of it, it was fantastic. Um, I was doing a play in Boston at the time, right outside of Boston. And so I had to go back up and I was coming back to New York to audition and then back up. I had to go back in several times for callbacks. And um, I remember thinking about Ash's voice like Spridal from Speed Rocket, or Speed Rocket, <laughs> from Speed Racer. Um, and also uh, Rudolph from those stop action. She thinks I'm cute. She's got him over here, you know? And then we yeah, like, got together, and my little brother was 10 at the time, and I recorded his voice to say, no, this is what a 10-year-old sounds like. Because at the time, they were so, at least for what they told me, they seemed to know so much what they didn't want, but they didn't know clearly what they wanted. So I did have the role, and then I was... Um, uncast when they thought they might get a child to play it, and then I was cast again when they decided not to use a child. All of these things were just, I was told, but I don't really know, you know, how the whole thing went or who the child was. Um, but anyway, so that was pretty exciting, and I'm, you know, I think for me, being able to play Ash was always really wonderful. His energy is so great. He's so positive. I learned a lot from him, for sure. And you did an awesome job, too. Oh, yeah. thanks, Bronco. <laughs> you want to go next, or you want me to go? I kind of already said how it happened okay. for me. I included it in my opening statements. I'm a little bit, yeah. I, um, in my opening statements. <laughs> I, uh, it's interesting, because I don't remember the name of the first character I played. Um, and I should just you know, go on Google and figure it out after <laughs> all these years. But the very first character that I played was a bully, and he was like one episode, and I really loved voicing this, this boy that was such a jerk. Um, because it was the beginning of every other boy that I ever voiced after that. It was like how I discovered to voice a male character. Um, so I owe a lot to that little guy, but I, I still don't know his name. Um, and then, you know, when Megan moved to Los Angeles and um, Eric, you were directing Yu-Gi-Oh! And who was directing Pokemon at that point? Season six. Everybody. <laughs> was, was it Darren? Was Darren directing Maybe it was Darren, time? maybe it was Tony, I don't know. But anyway, be. so I ended up getting called in for to audition for both of Megan's roles. Um, both directors thought I'd be a good match, and I know they called in other people, but 
Coincidentally, I was the best essence and voice match for both of Megan's characters. So, Megan, thank you for moving to Los Angeles. <laughs> my pleasure. Because <laughs> that was really a great jump start for, for my career. And um, it was really amazing. But it is so cool to meet you after all this, all this time. But yeah, that was, um, and then after that, just um, many more and more and more wonderful roles um, to come. And I'm still in the show. So working on it, so um, and it's been the journey of a lifetime. <laughs> to, to be continued. Yeah, to you be know, continued. I had a similar experience with like learning how to do a, a boy's voice like on the job, and but the only time I got cast as a boy in like more than one episode was another random show. It might have been Fighting Foodons. Yeah. And that was directed by Andrew Reynolds. Oh yes. <laughs> yes, he did. I don't remember that. And um, yes. Fried rice. Yeah. But halfway through, halfway through, I started sounding more like Butch. <laughs> you sounded like this. Yeah, I totally right. did. And, and uh, uh, the director was like, you know, you started off sounding like a little boy, and now you sound like Harvey Firestein. <laughs> I've been sending residual checks to Harvey Rod my whole life, is actually. <laughs> So, I, I haven't gotten too many little boy voices since then. I can do that. Erica broke the microphone. It's all good. It's all good. Hello, I'm back. Yeah. I'm better than before. <laughs> yes, so, seeing as how there's a lot of you, I've got just one more quick question, so... And then I'm going to turn it over to you guys. So, if you want to start forming the line, Behind the microphone, we're gonna to get to you in just a hot second here, all right? So I just need to ask, this being the 25th anniversary, uh, what has been your favorite part of being a part of Pokemon? Definitely the stories that everybody has. I mean, to be able to travel around now to conventions and hear everyone's stories of growing up and how Pokemon has helped them, I don't know, form friendships in their life. It's a foundation for all of us. That's been pretty incredible. Meeting the fans, right? I mean, totally. meeting the fans, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing to be part of something that is such a big part of pop culture history. Um, but when you step back and you see the, the human side of it and the connection, um, you know, to us, at least for me, it's not just a cartoon. I think that those characters are our friends, the way that they behave with to each other. Um, and also, what I really love about something like Pokemon is it did take the back of the video store anime shelf and make anime more mainstream, which let us discover more things about that whole genre and also have conventions like this where we can meet other people who love the same kind of stuff we do. And I'm a gamer geek, so I'm definitely, a, you know, I, I'm, I, I fit into the quirkiness. Um, I, you know, I like to see the way that here, being kind of different, is the norm, and I think it's an example of the way society can behave outside of conventions. So, you just accept people who, who are interesting, and that makes them cool. So, that's what I like about Pokemon. We're ready. Go ahead. Let's Hi. begin. <laughs> so, I know you guys said that you just messed, uh, met each other this weekend. So my question was, from my understanding, you guys didn't actually get to work with each other in the booths when you were voicing the characters. What was it like when you guys actually first met each other and do you guys have any funny stories to tell about those interactions? Uh, <laughs> we all, we would pass each other definitely while we were working on things. So if, uh, you know, one person's working and you get there five minutes early, you still have a couple minutes to chat. So we've all kind of seen each other, uh, for the most part, yeah. um, you know, in between sessions. And then if there's a party or something, we would all go to. But I don't know. I feel like I have a humorless life. I have no funny stories. <laughs> I remember. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, no, I was just thinking about the parties. Like there yeah. used to be, we used to go out together. So, yeah. Maybe because we were young. <laughs> and, and of course, I directed for, for all of those shows, so I, I had a chance to work with all of these people one-on-one yeah. -on -one for, for a lot of uh, uh, sessions, so um, not just passing them in the hall. So I think that also helped to develop these friendships. I mean, it's been a long time that we've all been friends. Yeah. 
I was just telling Eric the other night, I just confessed to him my story because he was like the last director there that I worked with. So, I, I mean, I'd worked with almost everybody and I would pass Eric all the time and hear about Eric all the time, but I was like, never really interacted with you and I was very intimidated. <laughs> Which is and so I, weird, because I'm just like such an easygoing, mellow dude. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's funny because I think I just built this up, this experience, what it would, you know, and um, it was wonderful because uh, we were fast friends, you know, immediately after the first time, you know, and he spoke my language in terms of um, old uh, theater genre and everything he said, I was like, oh, you speak my language. Yeah. You know, I wanted to be more like, and you would just name something vaudeville or something yeah. and I'd be like, oh, Jackie Mason, okay, yeah, I got it. <laughs> and um, it was just really nice to meet someone who spoke my language and, um, and um, but yeah, it was funny because I was a little bit uh, scared to work with him for the first time. <laughs> But then after that, it was wonderful. It is pretty cool to work with so many talented people. I mean, even though you know you're all on the same show, but then to just kind of bump into each other, yep. I feel incredibly lucky. Definitely. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Thank you for my childhood. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, Hi. So, I guess I'm wondering, like, is your guys' favorite character in the show you? Or do you like other characters more than your own? Oh my god. That's a good question. Yeah. I, I mean, I think a lot of the characters we all play, I mean, as an actor, we we, we try to bring some of the things that are our personalities into those roles. Totally. Um, I mean, m I guess my three, my three favorites would be Brock, James, and Kaiba. And they're all very different, but they're definitely colors of Eric. Um, you know, playing the sarcastic, you know, uh, obnoxious rival. Um, I know it seems like a stretch, but it came pretty easy for me. Um, the comedic bad guy stuff, I mean, I, I, I like to think that I might be a, a funny person, and I love funny bad guys. Dick Dastardly and Muttley were like my favorite thing on, on Wacky Racers. Um, so I love the shtick, I love the comedy stuff. Um, but yeah, and, and then Brock, I mean, he's a teenage boy who's distracted by shiny things. I, it's like my middle school and high school yeah, nice experience, choice. right? <laughs> I did think Colors of Eric should be your book. Colors of Eric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely Ash Ketchum's my favorite for sure. I mean, he's so fun. I mean, we we get in there and we get to know our yeah. own characters, so it's hard not to be like, yeah, that's my favorite because I know her inside and out. Um, but also working. Um, if if we got to go toward the end and the other characters were all laid in, or even watching the show afterwards, um, it's such a treat to hear, uh, just to hear other actors doing great work. Like, wow, that was a really good take. Oh, I didn't even think of that. I, I think we all have appreciation for what everyone else is doing, is what you're saying. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree. I love the characters I play. I have no, like, I wish I were playing that one but I really appreciate all the great work that people have put in to create the whole. Yeah, and I loved like when my son discovered Pokemon and it was fun, I'd be like getting ready in the morning to go to the recording studio and he'd be like watching Pokemon in the morning before school and he'd be like, mom, 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 is that you? Mom, is that you? Like he was trying to figure out which Pokemon I played, which was like the most adorable thing. It was so cute and he was almost always right. Like he figured out my range and everything. Awesome, good question. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, I was just wondering if you like watching the older, newer Pokemons better, and I was wondering um, if each of you had a favorite Pokemon. I watched a lot of the, sh the Pokemon when I was in it, because we watched it at home. Um, I, Since I'm not in it anymore, I haven't really watched it, but I keep up with what's going on. Um, I find it, I'm, I'm not mature enough, honestly, to see faces that are so familiar with different voices coming out. It's just hard for me. So I don't really watch the new show that much. Um, and I watch a lot of PBS, so that takes up a lot of my time. Um, but, uh, yeah. 
So, Do you have a favorite Pokemon? Oh, my favorite Pokemon. Uh, let me see. Uh, Pikachu. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah, I I gotta say I didn't even watch a lot of the original stuff when I was on it um, because I was working in production so much because I was directing a lot of the shows and work, and then of course moving on to Yu-Gi-Oh and stuff like that. So um, and I would review episodes in the studio all the time. So I really didn't watch them when they aired in the morning. Um, uh, I've, I've gone back to see some things and I like some clips that people share, but uh, they all felt like one long episode because we never took a break in between and stuff. So even when people ask me what my favorite, like, you know, story arc is, I'm like, it's not just one long journey. Um, uh, but the other thing is uh, my favorite Pokemon was, I think, the first one that I got to dub, um, which was Squirtle. Um, I'm the entire Squirtle squad as well. So, yeah. <laughs> So an entire episode of saying the same syllables in different registers so that you would know which Squirtle was speaking, that to me I should have gotten an Academy Award for. If you do say so yourself. Yeah, yeah I, um, I have watched a lot of Pokemon because my kids have been into it. You know, um, the new cast, the original cast, they like everything. Um, so I have seen a lot of it. I'll just leave that there. And um, uh, I'm the I'm now the voice of Morpeko and Hangry Morpeko. So I love Morpeko because I think Morpeko is hilarious. I'm so grateful to be part of that. And I also I've always loved Psyduck because Psyduck's so silly. But I just found out or just read that Psyduck isn't just confused. Psyduck has headaches, and I suffer from headaches. So I was like, oh. Little, the dark little, side of Pokemon. You guys actually have to, have to say that from the Rotom phone. So I just learned that too. And I think that was my line in the show where I talked about the headaches, I think, because I go as Rotom phone. But, um, oh my goodness, it's so, so scandalous. No, it's just so dark. <laughs> I love all of it. I love the original. I love, I, I like, I don't have a, a favorite, you know. I did like watching. The Bianca episodes with my son, just because that was the character that I really connected to, <laughs> um, just because she was always running into Ash um, and sending Ash into a body of water, which I just thought was the most hilarious running joke. I was like, "This is hilarious!" And I got to like, they let me kind of sing it. I was like, Wee! whatever. I wanted. <laughs> so I like to sing. So I was like, "Oh, that's fun." Um, as far as a favorite Pokemon, I don't know, there's so many good ones, but um, I really liked being Sandy the Eevee in like the Sun and Moon arc. Um, and that was so much fun. But uh, I don't know, I love all the Pokemon. But thank you for the great question. Good question. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Hello, I actually have a series of two questions. The first one actually pertained to uh, one of the previous questions. So, um, one of my favorite moments was when um, they're going through the backstory of James. What is some of your favorite moments? Oh, so that's a really good episode. Do you, do, it, does anyone know what James's last name is? Hamburger? James Morgan. Rock Harrison. Good. By the way. Um, I loved the backstory for James. I thought it made it uh, very clear that he is not a bad guy. Right, he's doing a job just like anybody else is, and um, you know, he had a tough uh, childhood, and um, I think that that was it, it showed a more human side to his character. Uh, I enjoyed that stuff, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, there was a lot of goofy stuff in the, in those in that story arc too. I do remember that. I don't remember a lot of it, but I do remember that. Did you like that as well? You like James's backstory? Yeah, it gave him more of a human side right. than just a villain. Yeah, okay, good question. Now, were there two parts to that? Oh, well, the second one is, um... Yeah. Is there any, um... roles that you're going to be review or doing soon that you're able to divulge? Um, well, yeah, actually, I just did, because now the fans have seen it, it's aired, I'm on Shaman King, which is a show that I did, what, 18 years ago or something like that. Um, I'm Marco, and then I'm another character. I got to reprise those roles, and it was um, it was a lot of fun. It was fun to see that stuff again. Um, so, yeah, what is that on? Is that on? We're all back together. Yeah. We're all back together. Yeah, so that was Just that was so really cool. cool, isn't it? Did you direct Shaman King? 
No, no, no Tony did. Yeah, no, I just was, I was just some characters on it, but it was, it's cool too because, you know, a lot of the times it's like, oh right, I was on that, or I did that thing. I mean, when you, when you've been working in the business as long as we have, sometimes it's like, okay, uh, can you play that for me or show me what that character looks like? Um, most of the fans know more than we do sometimes, so that was fun to do. So yeah, you can, you can catch the, you know, Marco on Shaman King, which is kind of cool. And that question was directed towards everyone. everyone. I have a lot of scenes with you. Oh, wow. I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> and we're all doing this remote now, too. Yeah. So everybody's recording from home, yep. um, and they're putting it all together, which is pretty cool. Like you were saying, in the old days, um, if when we were working on Pokemon, if you left town, um, you were missed. You were gone. But now, if you leave town, they can work remotely. Yeah. So you wouldn't lose the job today. Uh, luck, hopefully, which is a good thing. But working on Shaman King again is pretty awesome. That's for sure. And I think there are so many like story moments that we all love and we connect to. So I'll just name one, which is when uh, Amora and Aurora's that particular episode when Steam when Team Rocket stole Amora. I was really upset <laughs> because Aurora's was so upset. It was like the mom like daughter or mom son thing that kind of got me you know and I got really emotional during that episode um so it was just something that touched me personally um and like made me mad at Team Rockin <laughs> I was like I'm mad at myself because it was Waba Fett Waba Fett why did you do that <laughs> oh you know but um yeah and then so I'm coming who isn't back mad at Waba Fett <laughs> mad at Waba Fett for 22 years why not <laughs> Good question, though. <laughs> I, I have a couple favorites, I, and I'll go through them quickly because there's a lot of awesome questions to come. Um, I loved the ketchup episode with Pikachu. <laughs> That's why I said hamburger. Nobody got that. It's That just cracks me up, and I love that Nurse Joy is like a spy for good. Um, and you brought up something that, that made me connect to this idea. One thing I love about Pokemon Journeys is that the Pokemon are asked for their consent. Uh, I think that's very powerful and very important. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just curious. Twenty-five years is obviously a really long time. When did you guys realize like Pokemon would have the cultural impact that it really has, like in the longevity? Mm. Did you have a moment where you saw something out, like... Pokemon cereal and the... <laughs> uh, I don't know, any time a, sh a show has so much um, marketing connection so that it's constantly um, reminding you that it's still around, um, that's kind of when it was like, oh, okay. I think when the first movie came out and we had an opportunity to go see it in the theaters and it was red carpet, it was Ziegfeld, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, Walking in with the with the cast and 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 feeling like for that you know those fifteen minutes or however long the movie was that we were famous, um, it really was like oh okay you know this is this is a this is going to be something a little bit bigger than we're just in a little booth recording, um, and then also just the reaction. I mean, people you see wearing the shirts and the toys and the cards and this sort of stuff. Um, and, and, but I also do think the secret to the success of a show like that, it's really not rocket science. The characters are things that at least someone can relate to someone and the message that's there without being preachy. There is a moral to the story and, and the friendship and all of that is a lesson and something that we can connect to. And I think that because of that, um, we all still want to see it and we all still want to be involved with it. So that's at least for me. That's what I knew. I mean, did anybody get the Oreos, the recent Oreos? I got four packages. My husband came home with four. I'm like, what are we going to do with all these Oreos? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm still eating Pokemon Oreos to this day. Yep. I think, you know what's really crazy? When we were working on the show, we never knew um, until the season ended if it was going to be picked up again. So for me working on it, it was a, a, like one year at a time. And then we were replaced, which we thought we could be replaced every year. And then it did happen after season eight. But the interesting thing to me is that even while we were working on it, it was popular, all of that, 
Since now is when I've realized how powerful Pokemon is. To be able to come to a convention and hear from people how it has touched their lives and how it continues to bring us all together, this is the moment that I realize the longevity, the, the power of it. Because you fuel that. We, I, I don't know, it's a, I've never been part of anything like this that brings us all so personally together. Um, and so every time I go out and meet people is when I say, wow, this thing really, it's got legs, you know? <laughs> it's got, and it's, it's just really incredible. And I, I have to thank all of you for that because you are what's made Pokemon what it is today. I mean, it was started by someone, someone's imagination, Satoshi Tajiri, and it was carried on and it was marketed and whatever, but Pokemon lives on in your hearts and we are here because of you. And that I think is incredible. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello, it's a pleasure to meet you guys in hey. person. Um, so uh, everyone in this room knows that Brock has this little fantasy thing that he's got going with Nurse Joy and uh, Officer Jenny. Is there any chance that we could hear a little bit of an improv scene between Brock and Nurse Jenny's? Nurse Joy's? Well, what's really interesting is with two of them here, it's kind of like I'm in two different towns. <laughs> and in each town, they're different. Right? Even though they might look the same, they're different. Uh, I can clean, I can make jelly donuts. Would either of you like to go out with me? <laughs> I have to work at the Pokemon Center. <laughs> you know, Nurse Joy didn't... I don't know, I was gonna say, my name's Nurse Koi for the day, because we're still working on the show. <laughs> we're Nurse Koi. Uh, come on, boss, let's get out of here. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what was one thing that we said, you know, Nurse Koi said all the time? Um, we had to say, I enjoyed restoring your Pokemon to its full health. <laughs> which was always which was always fun, which would be a great thing for us to say to Brock when he's hitting on us. You know, just completely deflect and change the subject entirely. Yes, yeah, good question. Thank you. Nurse Joy never actually, I don't remember Nurse Joy responding. No. I, think she has I don't remember surprised. any of the yeah, female surprised. characters on the show <laughs> ever responding to Brock, except going like, eh, except for Misty, who would grab me by the ear, and for those of you who um, really want to dive into the Easter eggs of the show, any time I could fit it in, I would say, not the ear, every time, even when that shot took us to another scene, the audio of me saying, not the ear, every time Misty grabbed me when I was over flirting. Um, so li listen for that next time and see if, yeah, see if you can catch that. Thank you so much. You got it. Thank you. Um, I would like to know everyone's favorite line. Favorite line for Pokemon? Uh, hey, Brocko. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. <laughs> My favorite line is from the movie from with the unknown. You know the, the unknown with the floating little symbols? Yeah. James says, I haven't seen this many strange letters since I placed that personal ad. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it's like Highlander, there can be only one. <laughs> My favorite line is E B. V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V That's my favorite. And you can you can guess what Evie was saying. Is that how it's written? You know what? It's just written and like the mood and all that, and then we do word replacement. So like you know, if Evie's saying I love you, it's gonna sound really different than if Evie was saying Get the heck out of here. You know what I mean? But um, but we we choose the syllables that we use. To, to say those words that are in our head. And so, th you guys know this, every line is done individually. You know, there's no recycling within the show. You're going moment to moment. You're not just saying your name, you're conveying uh, thought, intention, and words. So it's really cool. It's like going back to acting school, really, because we did these, gibberish exercises. Do you guys remember those in acting school? And so it's like, oh, and they asked me if to be a Pokemon. I was like, I know how to be a Pokemon. I, I was an undergraduate at acting school, so I know all of that stuff. But yeah, 
<laughs> That's my favorite line. I like that Nurse Joy so often says, um, come back again soon. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? I, I never heard again? thought of that. That's hysterical. Yeah. That's funny. Good oh, question. You get a car wreck. Yeah. <laughs> come back for a coma sometime soon. Uh, hi there. Um, I have a, a question. Um, uh, so, not necessarily just specific to Pokemon, but are there any roles that you guys have where um, maybe it's a, a it's directly inspired by someone you know in your life? Like, for instance, in, in Yu-Gi-Oh, maybe you have like an uncle who's weirdly into kids' cards games, and that and that has an influence Kaiba. In some way. That's a good question. Mm. There's a, a voice that I have been trying to put in something for like 10 years, and we're not going to say who it's based on, but you will know. Um, it's a combination of this guy I met who was the um, translator for the Spanish ambassador, and he just had a funny voice, and someone that worked at 4Kids. And uh, the voice is like, is like this. And I really just have always wanted to be some sort of character uh, uh, with this voice. But uh, every time I audition with it, you know, they're, they're confused about uh, which gender I am. And, but that's a good time for this kind of thing. Do you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'll tell you later because I'm going to guess and I know. Can I, can I just say, you, th that voice sounds a lot like uh, uh, Dr. Nick from The Simpsons. Oh, does it? <laughs> now, okay. uh, now I'm going to have to stole Google it. it. Someone stole it from you. <laughs> do, do you have a voice that's someone you know? I can't think of anyone. I definitely would always listen to people on, like when I walk down the street or I'm on the bus and I think about um, just characteristics that come out and um, when I'm doing audiobook narration, I often put... Uh, notations in the script about that, like the person on the bus or whatever, that helps me get into the range. Yeah. But I have not ever modeled it on like someone in my family, essentially. So, um, I worked on a lot of shows where we would pick someone to do a Brooklyn accent. And some of them were just god-awful, I'm just gonna say it, okay? <laughs> So I am originally from Brooklyn, and I did not have a Brooklyn accent growing up, and I don't have one, but I can do one. But I never played a character with a Brooklyn accent, and I really wanted to represent my uh, home neighborhood, right? Um, so I directed a funny little show called Viva Pinata. And when that uh, show uh, came my way, and I was uh, working on uh, the casting, and I looked at the breakdown of some of the characters, I realized there was a newspaper pudgeon named Pecky Pudgeon, old school newspaper stuff. And so I got a chance to do my Joe Pesci, because everybody that I grew up with talked like this. They all talk like that. How you doing, Eric? How's your mother? The whole thing like that, yeah. So I finally had a chance to do that and imitate some of the guys from the old neighborhood. So that meant a lot to me. Yes, there you go. Well, thank you very much. You got it.